Hey there, friends. Welcome to another episode of Funkin' Friends. Today, I'm going to have my friend Lori Walmart join me. She is the author of many picture books, mostly featuring dead women in STEM, nonfiction books. And uh, we were having a little bit of technical difficulty, so we're getting a slightly late start, but hopefully everything will work out and she'll be able to join me. And uh, we will see, let's see if right now it can work. I just invited Lori to join, and we'll see what happens. Hey, there you go. I can just see. Just trying you. to figure out how to hold this so that <laughs> I can see my face. Oh yeah, do you not have a camera on the a front facing camera? Oh yeah, but I'm sort of holding it in my arms right now. Oh, that's okay. So much okay. for two tech people trying to you know do tech stuff here. <laughs> oh, this works. So how are you doing, Lori? How have you been? Good. Good been uh, working on a new dead woman in STEM book. Doing yeah, you had an announcement come last week, right? Right. That one's coming out next year, Codebreaker Spy Hunter. Um, that one's interesting because she was not a, a science and math person as a kid, like all the other STEM people. Who, what, who was? Who, who oh, was her name is about? Elizabeth Friedman, and she was a code breaker in World War I and World War II. And she was an English major, of all things. Loved Shakespeare. And she went to work for a guy who thought that there, was all the, there were all these hidden messages in Shakespeare. You know, that Bacon had written it and they had all these hidden messages. So she had to be analyzing Shakespeare uh, letter by letter. And by that, you know, it got her interested in code breaking. And she became amazing at it, you know, amazing at being able to see patterns and figure out all these codes. She's the person who started the CIA's cryptology division. Oh, that's awesome. Well, before we get too much into your books that aren't out yet, do you want to tell us a little bit, tell everyone a little bit about yourself, how you um, sure. got into writing and, and what and about a couple of your books? Okay, so like you, I'm a member of that elite club of people who are or were software engineers and now write KidLit. And I'm finding more and more of us there. So I was a software engineer for many years. I taught computer science for many years. And now I write mostly books about dead women in STEM. But next year I also have a, uh, just a regular fiction book coming out. So let's see if I can hold up. This is gonna be a good trick. <laughs> For those of us who are not coordinated to begin with, here's this my latest book, Numbers in Motion. And, and look at the gorgeous artwork on this. I have been so, so very lucky with the illustrators of my books. Who illustrated that one? Sophie Kovalevsky? That's the, uh, right, it's about Sophie Kovalevsky, and it was illustrated by Evgenia Neyberg. Okay. And it's gorgeous. And because so many kids are afraid of math, I really like her almost whimsical style because it helps draw kids in. So, you know, I'm very excited about that one. I've got, what I should do is, you know, looking above my head, we oh, have- Oh, there you go, yeah. Okay. And I'll post pictures of all of your books on the side of, so you have one about um, Grace Hopper Right. right, Grace Hopper, Queen of Computer Code. And, uh, and she was in the Navy and... She was an admiral in the Navy, which makes it her very unusual. One of the first people who was an admiral in the Navy. And she was the first person to use words like multiply and divide with computers instead of just numbers. So anyone can program now. You know, kids can program now. You don't need to be a scientist or a mathematician. And she so coined that, the term about bugs, right? right so well, computer bug. The computer term bugs. bug was already there. In fact, Thomas Edison used it. But she's the one who did computer bug. Okay. And then you've also got a book about Ada Lovelace, who is the yes. first it, um, computer scientist, right? Right. The first computer programmer and my first book. So, yeah. right. you know, a couple of firsts in there. And then my other published one is Hedy Lamar's Double Life. And yeah. 
Coincidentally, in today's crossword puzzle in the LA Times, one of the clues, one of the answers to a clue was Hetty, as in Hetty Lamar. Yeah, and that book just recently won a Crystal Kite. Is that not correct? Right, it won a Crystal Kite Award and a Cook Prize Honor Award. Yeah. So it's really nice to see these science and nonfiction books coming into their due because yeah. kids love nonfiction. They love reading about it. And um, so how did, you, how did you go from being an engineer to <laughs> being an author? One day, this was about 25 years ago, I had an idea for a middle grade book. And I love reading middle grade. I still love mi reading middle grade. I thought, huh, I'll try writing a middle grade book. More fool I. I mean, you know, hey, how hard could it be, right? Just write a book. No big deal. Yeah, it was a big deal. <laughs> and eventually no one bought that book. So I thought, okay, I, I'm not a writer. I'll stop writing. And I did for five years. Then I thought of another middle grade book. So again, wrote another middle grade book. How hard could it be? But this time I kept writing. I wrote picture books, I wrote poems, which made a big difference. Now I was seeing it as my career. I was getting so close to being published so many times that it was like, eh, you know what? Forget it. I'm giving up. The, this, clearly I'm not a writer. But at that time, I was taking a course at my college on children's literature. And when the professor found out that I had written a biography, she asked me to bring it in. And that was the Ada Lovelace book mm. and asked me to read it to the class. And I did. And they loved it. Well, you have to realize you had a class of 20 something teacher wannabes and me in a class. They just loved me. You know, so they loved my book. But it was not only was it enough to get me going again, but it was enough to get me to apply to graduate school and get an MFA in writing for children and young adults. So I went from totally, I'm never writing again, this isn't for me, to getting an MFA and starting to get books published. Well, clearly you had a knack and a talent for it. Um, and, you know, so I, I know that they, they loved you in that class, but you're, <laughs> um, but you know how it is. You, you've worked I, at it and, um, and, and you've got skill at writing for sure. And especially about writing biographies. When I give, I give adult ed courses on writing books for kids. And I say, you need three things. You need, you know, some talent. You don't need to be Hemingway, but you need something. You need willingness to learn and improve your craft and persistence. And I swear you need that more than you need anything else. It's just hanging in there. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, how, so how do you choose the subjects for your, uh, for your, bio? I mean, there, there, there must be, well, probably not as many as we'd like, but there are enough dead women in STEM and uh, <laughs> uh, that, that you probably have more than, you know, a handful of like lists of people that you someday want to write about. So how do you go about which ones to work on next? And that's exactly what I do. First of all, the reason I write about women in STEM is growing up, I swear, I thought your name had to be Marie Curie in order to be a scientist, because that was the only book about a woman in STEM growing up. So I wanted to write about women, and I love math and science. And they always say, write what you know, sure, but write your passion. That's the real thing. So that's why I write about women in STEM. I keep list. I'm, I'm sure you can imagine this because you know me, you can imagine I'm a list maker. Uh, you know, people I've heard of, people I need to research, first choice, second choice, um, ones that a book recently came out about them. So maybe I don't want to write about that person. Ones there's not enough research, um, resource material. And because I write about, as you put it, dead women in STEM, well, no, I Some don't put the, it that way. You put that, it that you're way. Right. I'm just repeating I, I put it that I've way. I've heard you say it before. <laughs> I put it that way. So if the person's still alive, 
the person hasn't made it to the top of my list yet because the person right. has to be dead. <laughs> yeah, good point. Um, but uh, so you have you, how many people are on your list that you someday want to write about right now? I'm sure Ooh. it's sorted in in you know various ways, like you mentioned. But right, and and you must have a few dozen. Oh, easily there are a few dozen possibilities. Yeah. And then there are more than a few dozen ones that I looked at. There are even some that I did research for and then decided not to write about. Oh, of course. Yeah. Um, you know, it just didn't didn't strike me as being the right person. Or maybe I wasn't the right person to write it one sure. way or the other. Yeah. Well, that's but, cool. Um, so... Um, you mentioned that you have writing tips that you like to share sometimes with writers. Did you want to give us a few of those? I think the biggest one is, well, there are two biggest ones. Someone else has to look at your writing. Mm. And I can give two examples of things that would have not been noticed if someone else hadn't looked at it. One is in my own writing. I had was writing a collection of poetry about uh, bugs. And I had a bug, a limerick about fleas. And in the flea, the flea is on the dog's tail, enjoying the view and the breeze. And I read that to my husband and he just, you know, fell over laughing that, you know, the breeze when the dog, when the flea is on the tail of the dog. <laughs> but one in someone else's writing she wrote, the kids whizzed off the school bus. Again, you, you sort of need someone else to look at your writing, not just for really obvious ones like that that you miss, but for everything. So that's one tip and equally as important. You get feedback on your writing and you put it aside and you let it sit for a little while because otherwise you're not absorbing the feedback. You're, you remember what you wrote too well. You have to wait until you forget a little bit and then you can come in fresh. So, yeah. So those are my two tips. Those are your tips. So I always have trouble when I get notes, I usually want to go and, and address them right away. I mean, it depends. Sometimes when you send off a manuscript, you know, if it's from an editor, the notes, you might not have worked on that manuscript in six months, depending right. on the editor. But um but so, yeah, I, I think, but sometimes I, I do love to sort of dive in, but I know it's best to at least sleep on it for a night <laughs> um, because your brain will think about things, whether it's in sleep or whether it's just over time. And I think that is one of the more helpful things is to give yourself some time with any notes that you get from someone. Right. And I used to have these, you know, you have the stages of grief. I had the stages of getting notes, right? So I receive notes from someone. So the first stage is, this is the stupidest thing I've ever seen. What does that person know? That person doesn't know anything. That's stage one. Next one is, okay, maybe the person knows things, but this still is not, you know, the comments really make no sense. It's wrong, yeah. It's wrong. They're wrong. Yep, next step is, okay, maybe the comments are right, but I can't do anything about it. I cannot implement yeah. those suggestions. And then the fourth step is, oh, you know, you finally, and that's part of that time, that you need that time to go through those stages of um, maybe not thinking the person is the stupidest person on the face <laughs> of the earth, no, but you need to get through that. Yeah, no, you're right. I mean, a lot of times no, getting notes is frustrating because you love your writing and you um, you want to believe that it's 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 as good as it can be. But the truth is that it can be better if you get fresh eyes on it and you approach it with uh, with you know if you're open to other people's suggestions who are exactly. probably hopefully even smarter than you. Especially, I mean, I always feel that one of the best things to hope for is that you are not the the best writer in your critique group because if if you are then um well i've never been so i don't really know but <laughs> i think that it if you're it's important to get critiques from people who are who are 
better writers than you or at least on your level because they're they're going to be giving you things that are going to make your writing better and and that's something that is um it it yeah there is a sensitivity level but it's also important and it's so. important to be open to what people are saying yeah it no, doesn't absolutely. mean that they're correct they may be wrong but if you have five other people in the critique group and they're all saying the same thing you know what they're probably right yeah it's unlikely that all five of them don't get what you're trying to do and you're doing it properly um although that has happened well no i would say when i wrote uh one of my books that happened that's about code i was writing um it was a earlier version that that we never did anything with but um I said, I brought it to a critique group and everyone was like, I don't understand what this is about. And these were adults. And I was like, okay, well, clearly this is the wrong approach because this is not working. If you don't understand the story as adults, then yeah, it's not and you, bring, you bring up a good point that in my case, in writing about technical subjects, if the mostly English teacher editors at a company can't understand it, chances are kids can't yeah you know so it becomes actually a good way to see if your writing works rather than showing it to someone who might have a technical background and just has that inherent understanding yeah no exactly and speaking of technical backgrounds um so what what were some of the first coding languages you learned i'm just curious okay summer after 10th grade i went to a summer program sponsored by the national National Science Foundation. It was in math. And I took three courses. I took algebra, topology, and Fortran. Oh, okay. So Fortran was my first language. It's the language I did in school. When I graduated, even though I was a scientific programmer, the program we used was PL1. Okay. I'm not oh, even one. sure anyone uses PL1 anymore. Yeah. I don't know that one. All right. Then we switched to Pascal. Um, yeah. That was the first one that I learned was Pascal. You have to remember, this is the time of mainframes. You know, mm -hmm. personal computers really weren't around at this point. You know, so it was these big languages that were being used. Yeah. When I was in college, I learned Pascal um, as my first language, but quickly they switched to Java. It was like that, the semester that I started right um, but uh no i don't know COBOL. um i see uh audrey prince is is asking about COBOL. i i never learned COBOL. did you learn COBOL? i didn't learn COBOL, but i went on a job interview for a company and they knew i didn't know COBOL, and they tried to convince me that this would be a good language to learn because i could do business programming which i wasn't interested in okay um, yeah but and interestingly enough, COBOL is still around and still going strong. Yeah. I um, I do mostly C and C++ today. Um, occasionally, Python sneaks in there. I do stuff in MATLAB, so that ends up being kind of more, you know, scripting language and stuff. Um, but I, uh, I, I learned Java. I did a lot of Java in college, but not really since then. But Pascal was the first one I learned. Although I realized I had a, a graphing calculator in high school. It was a TI-83, I think. And with that, they, I think it was, it had basic on it. I think uh, you, it oh, yeah, was basic. Oh yeah, I, I knew basic. I yeah, so ba so I actually reprogrammed. They There were games that you could, I don't know, download or share with each other. And one of them was like a stock market game. And I ended up like going into the code, which was basic, I believe. And uh, you, I changed all the names of the stocks to the <laughs> Simpsons characters. <laughs> so it was really just, it wasn't a find and replace, it was a manual thing, but I went and I, that was, so I, but I did see a lot of the code and that was maybe the first time I ever really looked at code was, was then. Um, so that was kind of my first experience with code was basic, but I didn't really, I think that basic has a lot of go-tos, right? Which are frowned yes. upon. So yeah, so, um, but uh, it's it's mostly been C and C++ for, for my life. I, I have a, a basic story for you now that I remembered that I learned <laughs> basic. Um, my husband was away on a business trip and I bought our first um, 
personal computer, a TRS-80. And the language was basic. And I went all out. I got 16K instead of just 4K. I mean, I was really... Wow. So I, pro I programmed it to put a little banner across saying, you know, welcome home, Toby. I'm so proud of myself. And it was getting home in the evening. So I was going to turn out the light so it would look really cool. Turned out the light. It turned off the computer. And back then, it didn't have any memory storage. Oh, so the program was gone. Oh, no. Uh, but you saw the computer. Yeah. So, OK, so your next book, you were saying, is about a uh, code breaker, Rachel. What was her last name? Uh, Elizabeth Friedman. Elizabeth. Why did I think Rachel? I don't know. Elizabeth Friedman. Um, so uh, but you also have a fiction picture book. Is that announced yet? That is not announced. Oh, okay, yet. then let's not talk about it. <laughs> but it is so it has nothing to do with STEM at all. Yeah. Let's just say dinosaurs are involved. Yes, you showed me you showed me what it some of some images from it. So um, right. Yeah, it looks super cool. Um, so then Codebreaker, which comes out next year, Codebreaker Spy Hunter. So right. this one sounds super cool. Um, I think and, so. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and so do you, are you working on other new ones right now that, that have, uh, that are getting close? And I guess you can't well, really talk about them if they're not. Right. Well, I have one that's out on submission right okay. now. Okay. And I'm just starting the research for another one. Cool. But in addition, I am doing a novel in verse about a woman in STEM. Nice. I had worked on this in grad school put it aside. Remember I said, you need to put things aside for a while. Oh, yeah. You know, so I put it aside for a few years, brought it back. It's like, it's just different. And it's so much fun to work in something different. Excellent. Very cool. Well, um, I have this hat that has random questions in it. Uh oh. And I would like to ask you five random questions that okay, I- Okay, do I get to pick? Okay, no, here I am pick. I pick. I mean, oh. I'm just picking randomly, but okay. Let's see. First question. Um, orange juice. Pulp or no pulp? Pulp. Pulp. Okay. Right. You need I, that fiber. Yeah, I would probably like, I like pulp better. I don't drink much orange juice because there's a lot of sugar in it, but right. um, But I, I do. Um, I Might do, as well make it count if you're going to drink it. Yeah. Um, but I, but I like, I always like the pulp. My grandfather used to make the fresh squeeze like early in the morning whenever we'd visit him. Um, you know, sometimes you'd get an occasional pit in your juice. Um, I, but uh, I had a summer job. I worked at a greasy spoon, and one of the things we did was made, as we called it, freshly squoze orange juice. Uh, okay, so cool, cool. True pain in the neck. <laughs> yeah, um, I can imagine. It, your hand gets tired after a while. Yeah. Well, we had a press, but oh, still. Okay, okay. No, we, we had one of those, like, it looks like an ashtray and has the thing that sticks up in the middle that you push down on to uh, right. twist it. Um, yeah. Okay. Question number two. Do you pronounce squirrel with one syllable or two? Two. I am in New Jersey and we have squirrels here. And one of my critique groups is called the squirrels because, <gasps> look, a squirrel. Wait, okay. you just said it. It sounded like one. Say squirrel. Look, a squirrel. Squirrel. That sounds like one. Squirrel. No, squirrel or squirrel? Squirrel. One would be know. squirrel. One would be squirrel. Oh, maybe the whole word is just one and a half and everybody <laughs> says it that way. I don't know. <laughs> Syllables are wonky. But okay. Question number three. Have you ever seen, have you ever seen like a black squirrel or a white squirrel? Yes. Here in New Jersey, um, I went to Princeton University, and one of the things they said, which I don't think is true, is, oh, we only, we're the only place in the world that has black squirrels. No, we had them at UMass, too. I think they're always at colleges. Maybe oh, they're only colleges. They're very that educated. That could be. Yeah, maybe. Uh, I, there, is, there are white squirrels. I, I went to, um, uh, there's a friend of mine who lives in uh, Rich, Richland County in Illinois, and they have white squirrels there because they gave me, it was a school that I visited once, and they gave me a postcard with white squirrels in it, and they're, they're like <laughs> famous for their white squirrels. So maybe that's the only place that I've seen white squirrels, but yeah, usually they're, I don't know, do you like squirrels or chipmunks better? That's not one of the questions. Oh, squirrels. squirrels? I, have a, I have a window right behind my yeah. um, 
Chipmunks are cuter though. I know, but I don't have them right here. I have yeah. squirrels that go up and down the tree. You know, we have a chipmunk down. that's outside and the cat like hates the chipmunk, like sits at the window and just gets so angry at this. One of our cats gets so angry at this chipmunk all day. But all right, anyway, okay, question number three. Uh, what is your favorite sport to watch? None of the above. No, you're not, none of, not even like an Olympic sport or anything? No, I guess I like figure skating. Figure skating? Okay, it's a sport. Right. Yeah, all right. Right, you know, because it's more artistic. But yeah. other than that, I can't think of any other sport. No, not like pool or with angles, you know? Yeah, that's true. Yeah, quite In fact, chess. one of my poems in my uh, novel in verse has it's to do with, with billiards. The, no, the, I, the um, ice skating and the uh, okay. paths it makes and the angles and the circles and everything. Yeah, there, uh, that, um, what was that? It was, it was a Disney movie, um, Blanken, it, like uh, oh, Ice Princess. I think it was called Ice Princess. But oh, the girl wow. is like a math genius and she figures out, like she does a project about, about um, ice skating and like uses herself, teaches herself to ice skate and do jumps. And it's all about like centrifugal force and like all those things. Right. And, and that's basically, and then like, she actually becomes kind of good at it. It's not a true story. It's a book too. I think it's the same person who wrote The Princess Diaries. Yeah, I think Can it's- Can I have it? Maybe, I think so. I could be wrong. I'm, I'm like, I'm trying to picture the, the, the posters and things like that, but I right. think it might be, yeah. So anyway. But uh, it was, uh, it wasn't bad. It wasn't great, but it, but it wasn't bad. Um, I don't know. I'm not really into teenage Disney movies. Although I like oh, a lot no, of them. High school, high school Musical is pretty good. Some of those, some of those yeah. are pretty decent. Um, yeah. Okay. Question number four. Let's see. What is your favorite Audrey Hepburn movie? Ooh, Sabrina. Really? I don't think I've seen that one. Oh. Um. My favorite is How to Steal a Million. Oh, that's, that's a good one. Yeah, that one I think they should remake. Like that one is really, really cool. I think that could be done really well. Like not that, that you know, this it's not good, but Sabrina, who's in Sabrina? Tell me about that one. Uh, Sabrina's with William Holden and someone else, but they did remake it. Yeah, Harrison they, Ford was in it, right? They remade it with yeah. Harrison Ford, and I can't remember who plays Sabrina now because it was Harrison Ford. Yeah, Greg Kinnear, was he in that? Oh, yes. So those those were two guys. Right. Anyway. Good okay. job. Well, all right. I'll have to check out Sabrina. Good recommendation. Yeah. Uh, okay. Last question. Last question. Do, 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 do. Oh, all right. What was your favorite class in high school? Math. Really? Absolutely. Math? I what? loved math. Okay. Um, well, I, was... uh, I, I mean, I liked math, but... I don't know if I had a favorite class. I don't know. So what, how much did you do like through calculus and like we, any past that in high school? No, no I, I did, no. I did calculus, but like just A and B. Not Same C. here. Yeah, I think. Same here, that's all that was offered. Oh, well we had ones like I, I was in the honors math until like 11th grade and then I kind of went down to, there was an in-between math. And so it was, I went, yeah. But um, I liked math. I was good at math. I wasn't great at math, but I was good at it. And I think that's why I liked it. I'm not sure I liked it because I liked it or if I liked it because I was good at it, you know? But I have a, I have a math story too. Yeah. When it was time to go into high school, the principal has a meeting for all the parents. And my mother stands up and asks about math because she knows I love math. Yeah. And she says, what, what advanced math courses do you have? Mm -hmm. And the principal says, do you have a boy or a girl? Oof. Oh. <laughs> she said a girl, and he said, oh, it doesn't matter. She's not going to continue on in it anyway. Uh, I can't believe a principal would actually say that anymore, but they might think it. Yeah, so, that's terrible. Uh, I, was, I was very happy to prove him wrong. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Did you have any books that you um, are into lately that you might want to share? It's okay if you don't, or if there are any like- Sure, I can show you a about. few. Yeah, go mm -hmm. for it. Okay, so we have different levels of books in KidLit. 
So I want to start with one that for the littlest littles, and this is Baby Loves Coding. And this yeah. is a whole series of Baby Loves Quarks, Baby Loves Aeronautical Engineering. I mean, yeah. it's just very simple board book. And probably is more for the parents than for the kids. But it shows that the parent is excited about the sciences and can share it with them. So that's one I really like. And then trying to, I am not the most coordinated person in the world here. What can I say? Ah, don't worry about it. Okay, so here we go to the other end for older kids. This is, oh, hang on. Uh, Baby Loves Coding is by Ruth Spiro and who is the illustrator, Irene Chan. Irene Chan, Chan. yeah. Okay, so Beastly Bionics is for older kids. This just came out. I've Ooh. never seen that one. Oh, this is by Jennifer Swanson. Oh, and yeah, it is Jennifer. so cool because basically it's animals that are, are like bionic. I mean, it, it just, it's a really fun, cool book um, to look at. So I like that one. Um, and when we get into picture books, oops, mm -hmm. here's one by um, Melissa, Stewart, Melissa yeah. Stewart, and the illustrator is Stephanie Liberis. Steph yes. I did, a, I did an event with her with, for that book. Um, ah. when it came out yeah yeah no um, it's great i'm not a big nature person and a lot of the science books that come out are about nature but this one you know it, it just makes it fun but i wanted to show another picture book because there's a we talk about nonfiction books but there are also informational fiction books books that give us information about a topic, but the book itself is fiction. So this is Bugs Don't Hug by Heather Montgomery. And the illustrator is Stephen Stone, right? So you can just tell by the cover, I'll hold it up again, that it's not strictly nonfiction. Right, because you've got bugs with smiles and you know clearly, you know, little baby bugs holding their arms out to the mama bug. Yeah, yeah. But it gives a lot of information about bugs. So I think even though I write nonfiction and not informational fiction, I think it's important to realize that kids also get a lot of information from informational fiction. Yeah. I, I think that um, all of those books that you shared, too, um, any books by those authors, those four authors oh. are all, you know, they write a ton of great nonfiction, informational fiction books. So if you just look I mean, up any Melissa of Melissa Stewart yeah. has written, I think, 280 books at this point. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and if any of you out there are educators, and I guess now parents, too, she has a blog called Celebrate Science. Yeah. And it has loads of information about sharing science with kids. Yeah, Jennifer Swanson has STEM Tuesday, and she started a podcast recently. Right, too, her Solve It podcast, yeah. where she has people come on, and she interviews them, just fascinating people talking yeah. about their work. I mean, there's a lot of really cool stuff going on out there right now. Yeah. So very cool. Well, thank yeah. you so much for joining me. Well, for, I'm glad uh, I finally could join you. I have no oh, idea yeah, why hey, I couldn't join you out. on the computer. It all worked out in the end. Um, <laughs> I uh, I hope that um, I hope that you are staying energized and healthy. And um, yeah, everyone, go out and and buy all of um, all of Lori's dead women in STEM books. Where can people <laughs> find you on social media if they want to follow you or connect uh, with you? Everywhere. It is Lori Walmark. It's just my name, whether it's, um, I'm not really on Instagram, which may be part of the problem, even though I have an Instagram account. Maybe. Never, yeah. Never used you, haven't, Instagram. You, you haven't posted anything. My wife does research and she wasn't able to, she had to go to your Twitter 
<laughs> right. Like I do, so. you know, Facebook and Twitter, but yeah. Facebook, Twitter, my website, it's all Lori Walmart. And on the website, there's a lot of free things that you can download, teacher guides, activity guides, STEM word searches. You know, if you're just yeah. looking for something easy to give your kid to, you know, pass the time, there's some STEM word searches. Yeah. So. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. And I, uh, I hope you have a great night. And I, hopefully we'll be able to see each other soon, eventually. <laughs> One of these days. <laughs> All right. Bye, Lori. Thank Bye. you. Thanks, Josh.